Good afternoon. Um, Welcome to Roaring Out of Recession, Lessons on How to Rescue Our Economy from Disaster. My name is Kitty Richards. I'm Acting Executive Director of Groundwork Collaborative, and I have the honor of opening this webinar. Um, we have a really timely and important conversation set up for today, so I'm going to keep my remarks brief. We are coming out of a period of unprecedented economic turmoil. During the COVID recession, millions of workers lost their jobs and unemployment rose higher in three months of COVID than it did in two years of the Great Recession. Yet despite the havoc that COVID wreaked on our economy and the devastation and grief it brought to families and communities across the country, we're now in the midst of a historic economic recovery. So the question is, how did we get here? The answer is big public investments from the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan to the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Chips and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. From the beginning of this crisis, our country chose to make significant investments in small businesses, multiple rounds of direct payments to households, implemented temporary emergency paid family and medical leave, expanded the unemployment insurance system, the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit, and improved access to health care and housing assistance. These investments not only helped us achieve a faster and more equitable economy over the short term, but set us up for a more resilient economy over the long term. Our economy has rebounded faster and more equitably than many of us, though not the great speakers on the call we have today, could really have imagined. And the recovery we're in the midst of right now stands in stark contrast to the painful and protracted recovery following the Great Recession. That's what we're going to dive into today, how we got here and what we've learned, because now really is the time to take stock of what went well, what we could have done better, and the work that's left to be done. Before I introduce our fabulous keynote speaker, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that today is the 22nd anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. So many people lost their lives that day in an act of senseless violence, and we'd like to take a moment of silence to commemorate them. And now it's my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Heather Boucher, member of the Council of Economic Advisors and the Chief Economist to the Investing in America Cabinet in the Executive Office of the President. Heather is one of the nation's most influential voices on economic policy and a leading economist who focuses on the intersection between economic inequality, growth, and public policy. Her latest book, Unbound, How Economic Inequality Constricts Our Economy and What We Can Do About It, was on the Financial Times list of best economics books of 2019. She's here partly because she's been advocating for big public investments for as long as we've all been here, including in her time as a senior economist on the Joint Economic Committee in 2008, and in her time working in DC to fight for a more equitable recovery in 2009, 2010, 11, 12, that period of the Great Recession and its recovery that we're really going to be focused on today. And she's been calling out how inequality, fueled by unequal economic recoveries, has harmed our economy as a whole since in the wake of the Great Recession, um, the last time many of us were having this conversation. I could go on and on about how influential Heather's scholarship and leadership has been in shaping our collective understanding of inequality and how to combat it. Um, and how excited I am to have her here to talk about how to build a stronger and more resilient economy over the long haul. Um, but I will refrain and instead I'll turn it over to Heather for her remarks. Thank you. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you, Kitty. Um, okay, great, there I am, hi. Uh, thank you, what a delightful introduction. Uh, I, um, as Kitty was doing the introduction, I was taking a look at all of the attendees here. So hello to all of my friends um, and former colleagues out there. It's wonderful to virtually be with you today um, from my fabulous office here at the White House, um, you know, bigger than my living room. But at any rate, uh, it's been delightful. I'm just really excited to be here today. Um, this is such an important topic, and I am so glad that Groundwork decided to do this um, this conversation now. Um, you know, now is the time to do an assessment of what happened during the, uh, re the recession, the recovery, and to, to, to really make sure that we're all on the same page of the learnings about what 
this means for our economy and what it means for policy moving forward. Um, in my career, I have lived through many recessions. We're going to talk about them today from uh, and, and how this one really uh, compared different in terms of both the scale and scope of the damage done to the economy and how quickly we were able to recover. And I think that the main theme of the remarks I'm going to say today is that President Biden, uh, he had a plan when he was running for office. Uh, when he came into office, he uh, executed on that plan, and we've seen the success of that. And this recovery is not an accident. It is him working um, with his partners, um, with Congress, um, across the, you know, trying to put his uh, hand out across the aisle to really make sure that we created an economy that was true to his call to build an economy from the middle out and bottom up and make sure that it is equitable and delivers um, for the American people. So with that, um, uh, Jaylene is going to show some slides, and I'm hoping that I can see them on the Zoom here, too. Um, there we go. Okay, so um, here's some slides. So, so before I get to the very first one, I want to note a couple of things. First, um, you know, when the president took office, as we all know, we were in the midst of an economic crisis. Um, we were seeing, you know, at that point, um, uh, more than 9.5 million said workers had lost their jobs um, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, about 4 million had been out of work for half a year or longer. I know that the three months prior to the president taking office, uh, job growth had been a relatively paltry 60,000 jobs per month. That may not be paltry in a recovery, but when you had that deep hole that we had to pull out of, that was certainly not, uh, not enough. And um, we knew that we still needed to do more. And that was the focus of the American Rescue Plan. As the president said during the campaign, he didn't want to just build back. He wanted to build back better. And the American um, Rescue Plan was the first step. In, um, in making sure that we're laying that strong foundation upon which to build a fair, more equitable, stronger, and more stable growth economic economy, or uh, uh, economic recovery for our economy. And there were a couple of things that I wanna just highlight first from the, the ARP that, um, that I think will, you know, are some themes that we'll come back to. You have to remember at that moment in time, we didn't know exactly where the pandemic was gonna go. You know, we had seen, you know, where it had gone before, but there were still new variants coming up. We didn't know how long it would take us to recover. And we also did not truly still understand the scale and scope of what the supply side challenges were going to be to recover. I mean, one of the things that we all learned is that it's pretty easy to turn an economy back off, uh, turn an economy off, but it's actually quite difficult to turn it back on and have all of the timing work out exactly. We had all of those supply chain challenges um, following the, um, you know, as we worked through the recovery and all of that was still uh, in front of us when the, um, when the president came into office. And so one of the principles behind the American Rescue Plan was to make sure um, that there was enough in there so that we knew we could be resilient to whatever came around the corner. Um, and I think uh, I'm sure everyone on this Zoom understands that we were acutely aware that we probably only got one bite at the apple. That was certainly the lesson from the Great Recession. We got the American um, uh, Recovery and Reinvestment uh, Act, and there were some folks that thought, oh, well, if we need more, we can go back to the well, and of course, that wasn't possible. I think we were all acutely aware that this was um, probably the last big rescue package we were going to be able to do for the, for the pandemic unless things really you know, changed marketedly. And it was important that there was enough in there to give families and businesses and communities across the country and state and local governments enough of a cushion so that no matter what came around the corner, they would be able to be resilient and um, to, to get through and, and weather that challenge. And then, of course, the second big uh, criteria was that it had to pass. This was a must-pass uh, piece of legislation. And, of course, we know that it was passed on a party-line basis, but it was important to get that whole party together. And so looking at the, the nuts and bolts of the legislation, I think anybody could come up with pieces on the edges that they might want to have changed or might want to have wanted to do differently. But at the end of the day, the important thing is that, that, it, that it was a piece of legislation that could get across the finish line um, because that was what was so important, that we made sure that we had those funds available. 
So that is a little bit about the context. Of course, I think everyone knows, you know, all the core pieces that were in it. Um, it was focused on making sure that we got those vaccines out there. Um, as we were saying in January of uh, 2021, we needed to get those shots in arms um, all across the country, make sure that we could safely reopen schools, all of those pieces and funds to support all of that. And then make sure that we were delivering immediate relief to families bearing the brunt of the crisis. Um, there was the $1,400 um, per person check. There were extensions to unemployment insurance benefits. Um, for, for um, the unemployed workers. There was emergency aid to cover back rent to help folks stay in their home and, and other um, homeowners uh, assistance. There was the increase in the value of the, the SNAP program, making sure that those at the very bottom had uh, increased resources to help them meet their food needs. Of course, very importantly, the uh, increase in the child tax credit from 2000 per child um, to $3,000 per child, um, and with a higher amount for children that were um, younger, under age six. And, um, you know, that was a really important piece of the puzzle. And I'll come back and I'll show some charts on that. And then a host of other things, you know, targeted at specific communities hardest hit by a recession. And then a lot of funding to make sure that communities that were struggling um, could be made whole and could get through this crisis. Okay. So that was the brief introduction on what we did. It was big, it was bold, it was both targeted and had some all-purpose general, like the checks, um, support in there. And it was, of course, there were a lot of other um, elements of the policies that were going on as well, but it wasn't all ARP. Okay, so Jaylene, next slide. So what did we see? A strong recovery. Okay, so now I'm gonna just inundate you with a number of charts that all basically make the same point. Um, when, um, uh, at the beginning, you know, in that January, the Congressional Budget Office said that it would take four years, four years to get the unemployment rate back down. And next slide, that is, of course, not, oh, no, oh, no, not what happened. Um, Jaylene, are you, uh, okay, well, there we go. So let's just skip that, um, that slide, which was, um, that was the, we're having some slight difficulties today. Um, on my screen, that shows um, that the, uh, let's just go to the next slide, Julie. Sorry, folks, I will, um, we'll, we'll make sure to get you the slides later. They, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, and Jaylene, maybe can you work with her to make sure that the slides, great, thank you, awesome. Um, and so what we know is that compared to prior economic recoveries, this recovery was one of the fastest in terms of getting payroll employment back up. So whereas in, um, you know, we saw that sharp dip in um, payrolls uh, when COVID hit and, and everybody was sent home for the health and well-being of us all, you also saw that sharp uptick back. And now we can see that actually relative to any recovery going back to the um, uh, to, to, 2000, to the early 1990s, we are better, um, we have recovered faster than the early 90s recovery, the early 2000s, um, and of course from the Great Recession where it took 77 months, as this chart shows, to go back and reach peak payroll employment. That is an historic accomplishment. And I was just at the Jackson Hole Conference, the, the big Fed conference a couple of weeks ago, and one of my colleagues from the Fed as we were talking, um, and I've known this person for almost 30 years now and kind of argued about, you know, fiscal policy and all the like. And he turned to me and he said that the big lesson learned is that unemployment in the wake of a recession is a choice. And that is what this chart shows. And it was really a profound moment um, for me. And I think we've all had these moments talking with people, but also seeing with our own eyes that you can have a different kind of recovery. And that recovery from the Great Recession was, um, you know, relatively slow. It took a very long time. And there were, uh, you know, millions of people and families who were scarred by that, who um, were scarred in terms of their income, in terms of their ability to save money, you know, get those kinds of get jobs that allowed them to save money to uh, be able to buy assets. But also we know that that has um, long-term effects on those folks that graduate into those kinds of economic um, conditions. And we have avoided that in this recovery. And so if you think that growth is about, you know, the number of people in your economy and the innovation, right, if we just go back to the basics, making sure that people are not scarred 
and that businesses are not scarred um, from a recession, that we get back to work really quickly, that's not only going to help us in the here and now through, you know, as it has over the past couple of years, but that is laying the foundation for long-term growth. So that is one of the key messages. A, we did it. And B, this is a really important um, way to think about metrics for the economy. Now, I'm a little anxious that my other line chart, um, the next one, uh, hopefully, Jaylene, we can see that one. Next slide. Okay, great. So this is just another way to look at that same story, looking at the unemployment rate, not just the payrolls, huge spike in unemployment. And yet you can see that we've come down. So when CBO said it was going to take it four year, us four years, we actually did this in less than two. So that is also an historic accomplishment. Got those jobs back, got people back to work, got that unemployment rate back down. Next slide. At the same time, as we got the un okay, yeah, so sorry, as we got the unemployment rate back down, this is the employment to population ratio for prime age um, workers. I think many of you know what this chart looks like, but what it shows is that we are back to levels that we have not seen since 2000, which was the last peak in the employment to population ratio. So not only did we create jobs, lower the unemployment, but we brought people back into the labor force. We've created an economy so strong that it's pulling people in. That is exactly what you want to see in an economic recovery. And again, that is laying the foundation for um, not just short-term growth, but for medium and long-term growth. This, is going, this means that people are going to be they're developing skills or developing expertise and we'll be able to move forward. So a historic recovery in terms of jobs and what's happened in the labor market on that level. Also, a really important recovery in terms of wages and equity. So next slide. What we've seen over the course of this recovery is that um, we've seen wages come back. So that's what this chart, chart shows up here. Um, and I think what's important, there's a number of different ways to show the equity issue. And I know for, you know, because I've looked at the list of who's on the call, so those of us who want to really nerd out on the different definitions of um, who's counted um, uh, in these, these numbers in terms of looking at wages and some of the compositional effects as all those workers lost their jobs, so many service workers were at the lower end of the wage distribution, we can have those conversations. But what I wanted to do on another time, but what I wanted to do with this chart is to show that when you just look at production and non-supervisory workers, those folks that are not, um, not managers, not at the top of those, of those orgs, they've actually seen their wages come back faster relative to um, workers overall. And that is one way of thinking about the distributional consequences of a fast recovery that brought people back into work and that has pulled people back into the labor force. So this recovery has been strong and it's been more equitable. And again, there's a bunch of different charts that I could show you here, but this was one that um, I both had on hand and I thought was a, a, a compelling one. So let's go to a couple of the challenges. Um, next slide, Jaylene, please. Um, so we all know, and we're going to get new data this week, um, we all know that one of the biggest um, pushbacks on this recovery, like if you read the newspaper and you want to know, well, why isn't, doesn't everybody think this is the best recovery in generation? Because the case I'm making for you here today, um, people will say, well, it's because you have that, that really bad inflation. And of course we did. A little over a year ago, we had over 9% um, inflation and this has been really challenging. And it's been challenging for families all across the country. We know when prices rise, especially for food and energy and the things that have risen, this also has distributional consequences. It's hard for people to make ends meet. Um, it's also hard, it makes it just that much harder for firms to invest because everything that they are buying is a little bit more expensive. That's all super important. Um, but let's also remember that even though um, we have seen this, um, uh, this rise in inflation, the United States has not been alone here. And I think that is a really important uh, thing to remember. We did a bigger, more robust fiscal response. And yet, Jaylee, next slide. Um, our measures of inflation, while they did bump up, they have been in line with our colleagues. And um, this this is not this chart is not totally up to date. It's a couple months out of um, date, so it's come down even a little bit more. So we are um, we have been a part of the pack and have been coming down faster than um, pure countries. 
And so when you think about the overall success of what we've done and you think about the costs of it and the, you know, the pros and the cons, the costs and the benefits, certainly we did have this, um, the prices rose quickly. And um, I want to talk about that story in a second. But Len, Shailene, can you please go to the next slide, which is um, global unemployment rates. And one of the things you can see here is that while the United States went higher than our peers in terms of unemployment rates, we have also come down much faster. Um, and we are now, um, you know, uh, back down to, to where we need to be. So I think this is all a long way of saying that we did the things we needed to do. There were some challenges. And, and I think, you know, the economics profession right now is still trying to suss out all the different you know, factors that went into the high inflation. Um, did the Fed act too slowly um, or did they act just at the right speed? You know, what were the challenges? How much of it was demand caused inflation versus the supply side challenges? And there is a lot of research and evidence that is really pointing to the fact that it was about the supply chain fragility. Now, many folks, and I know some of you on this call here have been talking about the fragility of global supply chains for a long time. And that that left us vulnerable in a crisis. And that's, of course, exactly what we saw during the pandemic, that when we needed things, they weren't there. We couldn't get them because, of, um, because our supply chains had become so fragile. We were unable to get the things we needed. But it also meant as the world reopened after COVID, you know, an outbreak of COVID in a factory in Malaysia could upend the car market in the United States because you couldn't get the, the parts that you needed, all of which you know, as those things happened all across the world, that all added to the, the pressures on businesses, made it costlier to do business, and led to that pressure on um, the supply side, which is a big piece of this inflation story that we've seen. You know, also the fact that, you know, families still had income because we'd given them a lot, so they were still able to demand things. But again, I think these are the questions that our economists are going to continue to debate and look into and research. But it's really important to understand that um, the benefits of this, this historic benefit, um, uh, we were not uh, out of um, sync with what was happening in our peer countries, even though we had a better set of economic outcomes in terms of growth and were able to get our unemployment down. Next slide, please, Jaylene. So the next thing I wanted to focus on just for a moment is um, you know, one of the goals of the president's plan was to make sure that we were keeping, um, uh, oh, sorry, I went, sorry, uh, I, apologies. Let me go through this one point that I wanted to make here. I wanna come back to the, the top and like close the loop, which is that this recovery, as I noted at the beginning, was stronger than, ex than experts predicted. Underlined and italicized that, because it's really important as we tell the story of what happened, is that um, this, we didn't know how good it could be. It kind of goes back to the anecdote I told you about the colleague who said, wow, I didn't realize how much of a choice that high unemployment was. Next slide, please. So this is what the um, uh, Congressional Budget Office and um, IHS, which is a financial, um, they do uh, macro forecasting predictions versus actual for the unemployment rate pre-rescue plan. And what you can see is that you know we were all having a debate that time at that time at the turn of um, you know the uh, at, at, around the inauguration about what we needed to do and how beneficial it could be, and you know it really is the case that taking those steps um, really lowered what we thought um, uh, we would able uh, lowered how low we were able to get with the unemployment rate relative to what was predicted. And so I think it's important that we just keep in mind that this is the opportunity to tell that different story and to understand the economics of what's happened here so we can make better forecasts in the future that um, really fully account for the strength of um, uh, how, a, how a really robust fiscal response can have such a sharp effect on the economy. Now, next slide. I want to talk about equity for a few minutes. I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm kind of rushing through this a little bit here. There's so much to say. So we, um, as, I, as I started to say a second ago, the president was really focused on making sure that the little guys, small businesses, families were able to make it through this crisis. One of the statistics that we are so proud of is that 
Um, while not every business made it through the crisis, we have seen that 2021, 2022, and it looks like 2023 will be the, um, the third, 2023 will be the third um, record year in terms of small business startups. So really creating that environment for businesses to thrive so much because we were able to send those strong um, economic uh, policies out into the world that gave them that foundation. I wanted to show a couple of uh, other slides on some of the ways that families had that extra economic resiliency, which was a core part of the, um, the rescue plan. Next slide, please. So this, I know that these are starting to change as we work through the, um, the, uh, the recovery and the excess savings that families have had, but this gives you a sense, um, and sorry that, that somehow the, the slides are still, um, they got messed up in the email. Um, this gives you a sense of household financial indicators and you know, where families have been um, and, um, and how they are, uh, you know, have changed relative to pre-pandemic. And so we had seen a lot of indicators that this recovery uh, was, was strong and that it was um, having those kinds of distributional effects that we'd like to see, that people were not being um, delinquent on their mortgages, that they, we were not seeing bankruptcies. Of course, as we kind of work our way through this recovery and get back to normal, we're seeing some of these things start to uh, turn back around, but these are some really strong indicators of the strength of the recovery. Next slide. Hopefully this one will look good. So um, I, I want to come back very quickly because we're going to get new data this week on um, child poverty. Of course, one of the things that we know really affected the child poverty rate was the child tax credit and that expansion of the CTC that happened as a part of the American Rescue Plan. And you can see in this chart, this is a projection of what the numbers will look like when we get the new income poverty and health insurance data from census later this week. We can see um, you know, what a really important role the economic impact payments, that's what the EIP stands for, so the checks that families got, the important role that they played in 2020, as well as in 2021, but that really important role that the child tax credit paid, played in lowering poverty. And of course, those expired at the end of um, the end of that year, uh, and so we have not seen um, those be taken back up, but that was a core part of the equity agenda that was embedded in the president's um, vision. Shailene, please skip the next slide and go to the one on um, uh, the unemployment rate of black workers. Okay, so the last one I wanted to, to just end with here before I get to my final slide is, you know, one of the things that we have seen is that actually um, the unemployment rate for black Americans um, along with a host of other numbers, um, has hit historic lows. So we've actually now seen that the unemployment rate has been lower than 4% for, I believe, 19 months and counting. Um, that's a historic record going back longer than I've been alive, and I'm sure many of us on the call going back more than 50 years. And um, we've also seen that the unemployment rate for Black Americans hit series lows going back to 1980, We've seen that the labor force participation rate for prime age women has been uh, 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 higher than it has been at any time since uh, 1948. Um, so there's a lot of indicators about the strength of this recovery, and we know that when you get to that, when you get close to full employment, when you really have an economy that is pulling people in, that that pulls everyone in. And that's exactly the kind of recovery that we wanted to see. No scarring, pulling everyone in, getting folks back to work. And all of this, again, is um, laying, and Jaylene, you can, um, I think let's end with, let's end the slides now and I'll just end with a couple of just final remarks. I think for the president, it was really important that we didn't just to use his words, build back better or build back, but that we built back better. That in every step of the way, we were focused on making investments that would carry through, that would put us on a strong foundation upon which to, to create further economic growth. We knew that we had to deal with the immediate crisis in front of us. We needed to make sure that, that was, there was that resiliency. It's exactly what we've seen. And that has laid the foundation for the President's Invest in America agenda, which is the combination of the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is um, all of that infrastructure that is going up all around the country, um, the uh, Chips and Science Act, which of course is investing in semiconductors and new technology, and of course the Inflation Reduction Act with its $370 billion of investments to move us um, towards building a clean energy economy, which is where competitiveness and growth is going to be coming in the decades to come. We're going to need workers for all of these things. We're going to need investment. 
We're going to need an economy that um, can deliver for the American people. But because we acted swiftly and boldly and didn't listen to the naysayers that said, oh, well, it's not that important or we don't want to go too big, we went big and bold, and that is delivered for the American people. And again, we know that there were some challenges. We know that inflation was too high. But at the end of the day, those millions of people who got back to work and these historic um, increases in labor force participation, employment, um, historic lows in unemployment, really is a testament to the economic security of the American people. Most of us get most of our income from holding down a job and put us on a solid foundation to have an economy that can thrive and in the president's world, words, um, uh, build an economy from the middle out. And with that, I apologize I went over, but this is an exciting topic. I think I'm handing it back to Kitty. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, and no Thanks. apologies necessary. It was really exciting to get to hear all of your remarks. Um, I'm just gonna say I'm excited to welcome Emily Stewart, Senior Correspondent at Vox. Um, Emily will introduce our outstanding lineup of speakers and moderate what is sure to be a very stimulating discussion about the lessons learned from the COVID-19 recession and the Great Recession and how we can ensure policymakers center people before during and after economic crises in the future. Um, so Emily, take it away. Hello, uh, thanks you guys for doing this. I'm excited to get going. Um, so to introduce our panelists, we have J.W. Mason, an associate professor of economics at John Jay College and a senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. Uh, Rakeem Maboud, chief economist and managing director of research and policy at the Groundwork Collaborative. Indi Dhiragupta, President and Executive Director at the Center for Law and Social Policy, and Angela Hanks, Chief of Programs at Demos. One little programming note, we're going to have like a Q&A if the audience wants to chat at the end for the last 15 minutes. So if you have questions, like pop them in before 2.15. Um, so with that, I'm gonna kind of hop in. We got a lot to get through. So kind of before we get to discussing the, the recent COVID recession and recovery, I do wanna talk about the Great Recession and the recovery from that. And this is gonna go to you, Rakeen. You know, when you think about the recovery from the recession before this, especially compared to this one, what's the story that you tell yourself in terms of what that looked like and how that went? Yeah, the words, first of all, Emily, thank you so much for doing this. And I'm so excited about this conversation. I mean, Heather's remarks were remarkable and I think Really speak to the, the importance of this moment and to have this conversation in this moment. Um, when I think of the recovery coming out of the Great Recession, the words that come to mind for me are stagnant, jobless, unequal. Um, you know, it was not a recovery, you know, in direct contrast to what we just saw in, in Heather's remarks on her slides, um, a quick recovery that really brought a lot of people into um, a thriving economy, right? It's it's a it's a recovery that took a really long time that ground um, ground our economy down and took a long time for us to come back out of. And so, um, you know, I think that's part of why we're having this conversation today is because we are seeing a really really different outcome today. And part of that is because we took a really different approach, right? I mean, the the um, attempts to bring the economy back after the Great Recession were really centered on. The idea that something that big financial institutions are too big to fail and that if we, you know, prop them up, then the benefits would really kind of trickle down to the rest of us and all of us would be OK. And the evidence bore out that that was not the case, right, that um, regular people did not reap the benefits of investing in big financial institutions. We didn't actually address and center real people um, in, in our recovery efforts. And that, again, is really stands in direct contrast to what we did this time around, which is investing in people, making sure that the everyday workers and families who keep our economy going were able to thrive and make it through this crisis. Um, and so I'm sure my co-panelists have um, thoughts here, too, but I'll leave it there and, and let them jump in. Yeah, I'm curious, JW, if you have thoughts on that as well, from like how you think about last time. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. It was a real missed opportunity, a real real policy failure in some ways. Um, and I think I think one of the big lessons that I think some of us really learned at the time, but has been absolutely reinforced by the experience this time around, is that the um, 
The supply side of the economy is a lot less stable than we used to think. Um, this is partly, you know, the sort of fragility of supply chains we've seen, but it's also in the way that weak demand undermines supply, undermines the productive capacity of the economy. And it's very clear that we didn't just have years of low employment and years of slow growth and years of depressed income, bad as all those things are, but we also had chronically depressed investment. And so we came into this you know, cycle with less productive capacity than, than, than we uh, could have had. You know, Some of the shortages um, that we've seen over the past couple of years that have contributed to inflation, I think are very clearly the result of the weak demand and the weak response to the last recession. So we, one of the big lessons is, is the supply side of the economy is not going to take care of itself. And it's not just a matter of you know, the traditional supply side measures you know, education, training, you know, basic science, which are, are all very important, but you also need to maintain steady demand in the economy or you, you undermine the, uh, you know, the supply side of the economy as well. And I think that very clearly happened um, in the wake of uh, 2007. So to like a certain extent, we set ourselves up for a, a tricky situation this time, maybe. Kind of to move on to, so obviously the current recovery, um, kind of the, the same question, and I'm going to direct it to you, Indy, first. When you look at this current recovery post-pandemic, to the extent we can call it post-pandemic, all of those caveats, you know, what's the story you tell yourself now? Like, what did we learn here? Do you think this was successful, or, or how do you think about it? Yeah, thanks, Emily. And uh, let me also transition a little bit from the previous question with uh, a comment that I think just builds upon everything that Rakeen and Josh have said, and even um, Heather earlier and Kitty, and that is that the choices you make in these moments have durable consequences. There is a misperception at times that, you know, we're just choosing between levels of human suffering and, and that's that, which is frankly an easy choice for me in which direction to go on that front. But for some, it's apparently a tough choice. But so, but, but the fact is you are, making choices that will shape the future trajectory of our economy. Um, and, and Josh, I think, really illustrated that well on the uh, undermining of the productive capacity last time around. So when I think about this recovery, um, I think uh, one thing I will say is I really do think we actually built upon our for all of its shortcomings. Um, and, and one of the major ways uh, we did, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which followed the financial crisis, was that um, unlike previous responses to recessions after the Great Depression, we typically just did two major things in response to recessions. We just extended unemployment benefits, sometimes so late the recession was already over, but of course we know that the labor market recovery can take a long time, and we usually cut taxes or gave people stimulus checks. So one thing that ARA really helped break the mold on, but of course it mattered who was in power, uh, was saying we need to do a more comprehensive set of investments in the in the country. And um, I think uh, that said, it was, uh, I think, knowably too small back then, right? We just, as a reminder, we knew Christina Romer was making very clear inside the uh, White House at the time that uh, it was too small. Um, she was pushing for things more in the 1.2 plus trillion dollar range. And ARA may have, uh, I mean, I, I tend to believe it probably prevented a much, much, much worse, potentially even uh, sort of lesser depression. But then to take six years, for example, for net worth for people in the bottom 50% to recover, to um, take, uh, you know, building off of Heather's charts on payroll employment, the jobs gap, which looks at how many jobs you need to create to keep up with population growth as well as um, uh, sort of maintain the pri the prior level of jobs um, that took uh, over uh, or nearly seven years, eighty four months it took uh, uh, to recover and close the jobs gap after the last recession. Uh, it took twenty months after this recession. Um, the 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 scarring Heather talked about. Um, you know, obviously we need to take seriously what we've done in this recession or in response to this recession, is take a comprehensive approach that really said we got to focus on families and we've got to focus on small businesses and we need to figure out exactly what's needed to undo the 
barriers in um, our economic potential, uh, including a lot of focus, obviously, on the supply chain. But um, we did things that uh, we have been saying for a long time we should do anyway, regardless of the business cycle, like the child tax credit, the enhanced and expanded child tax credit, which really helps stabilize families um, across the board. And uh, that's a great example of uh, an opportunity where you don't easily come back from not helping families in tough times. And when you do do it, you are setting yourself up in the future for success. I, I'll just stop, uh, uh, lots more to say, obviously, but on this, that child tax credit is an investment that pays for itself over nine times over. Okay, so that, and that is a good investment all the time, but we're having all this public conversation now about how students fell behind because of the pandemic and some of the decisions that were made and had to be made. And that's important. but. That, that just underscores that in any crisis, in any downturn, remember, you're making decisions that will affect us five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road. If I can just add one quick thing to Indy's comments, which I agree with 100%. Um, you know, there is one other thing that we do in recessions besides the two you mentioned, and that's cut interest rates. And, you know, after, after 2007, we had about eight years of zero interest rates. We had these enormous quantitative easing uh, programs, and yet we still had an extremely weak recovery with extremely depressed employment. Um, so I think one of the other big contrasts and lessons here is that monetary policy is a lot conventional or unconventional is a lot weaker than we thought and big fiscal really gets the job done. So I think, I hope one of the takeaways we see here is that the job of macroeconomic management really cannot be left to the Fed. Um, you know, I think that's that's a, a, one of the real sharp contrasts here. Yeah. Um, Angela, I did kind of wanna ask you a little bit as somebody who saw some of this from the inside in terms of the recovery from the you know the pandemic recession like how do you think about it like how fast jobs came back and then kind of what's happened subsequently with the chips act or with the investment reduction act like what does the sum of this say to you about like where we are in the economy and compared to where maybe we could be yeah thanks for that um i'll say a couple of things i mean i think the biggest kind of two things that i think about going from the great recession to uh the covid-19 pandemic um, is it's really a story of lessons learned. Um, none of these investments could have happened in uh, 2020 and beyond uh, had it not been for during the period following the Great Recession, the conventional wisdom shifting away from, um, you know, what to Indy's point was um, a large sum of money back then, but not nearly enough. Uh, to really thinking about public investment as the antidote for a recession. Um, and that just doesn't happen by accident, right? Like that's not um, like, oh, people just change their minds and they think differently now. Um, and you you know that for sure, because there are still some folks who uh, thought that we shouldn't spend last time around, think that we shouldn't have spent this time around, um, even folks who are more inclined to support the administration overall. And so, you know, that is a shift away from those folks being empowered and those ideas that that they stand behind being empowered um, to a different way of thinking and a sort of different uh, um, center of gravity around how we think about the economy. So I just wanted to, to put that out there because I think that's like kind of critical. Like this is not just the economy change. This is like, um, uh, a set of actors made a different set of decisions. Um, and that's really important. And I think it's to some of what we'll talk about later and how to make sure that we don't forget why this was good <laughs> the next time uh, a recession hits. Um, so the other thing that I'll, the other two things I'll quickly say is I think the the interesting thing about this recession and the last one is, um, you know, I don't want to sort of uh, minimize the incredible amount of suffering that happens in a recession, even when things are good or the, even when things improve quickly, people feel real hurt during the, the downtimes. And because these were recessions were 10 years apart and were both so significant, um, you know, it's not very often that you get to actually experience the counterfactual, right? Like you don't get to see, oh, what would have happened if we had spent more money? What would have happened if we had done things differently? And I think that's sort of a big takeaway that I have is we actually get to see and live the counterfactual. And that's something that I think is, conti is continuing to pay off in the way that we think about the way that we are coming out of, the, uh, came out of this recession and then uh, we'll come out of the next one as well. In terms of um, sort of the, the inside, um, I was really uh, fortunate to be at the Department of Labor uh, at the beginning of the Biden-Harris administration. Um, 
And I'll just say a few things about that. I mean, I think, of course, at the Department of Labor and across the administration, we're all obviously closely monitoring uh, what was happening with unemployment. Were workers getting into jobs? Were they getting better jobs? Did they have support in the interim period? Um, and actually, I'll say something that Indy told me a couple of years ago that Indy, I hope you don't mind. I use this with everybody um, about, uh, I think being on, and tell me if this is wrong, if I'm characterizing it wrong, but being on ways and means uh, during the great recession and there being a big fight about whether or not to add 25 or $50 in supplemental unemployment insurance. For the majority of the time I was in the Department of Labor, we were at $600 and then $300 supplemental unemployment insurance, um, expanded benefits, expanded categories uh, for the types of workers um, who are eligible for unemployment insurance for the first time. Um, and I think we'll talk about this later, but one of the kind of key takeaways for me is both one, that that's really good. It helps people uh, you know, stay in their homes, feed their families, uh, look for a good job that actually pays something commensurate to what they were making before. Um, and uh, it was temporary. And so a lot of those things that we, I think, thought about how unemployment insurance could work, for example, um, we realized could change, right? Like overnight, they created an entirely new program for people who had previously not been eligible for UI. And so I think uh, in thinking about sort of the longer term structural change that's needed, um, we have a good roadmap because we did a lot of things just temporarily, and now we need to go back and do them for real. Can I jump in briefly just to add to yeah. Right, which is, I think there's this conversation that we're all sort of in the mix of like, you know, and we all, we've all heard it of like, should we risk doing too much or, is, or should we risk doing too little? Like which one carries the bigger risks, right? And something I've really been thinking about a lot in you know preparation for this conversation, but also more generally is the idea that risking doing too much is the like worst outcome is really premised on a complete sort of lack of analysis around power dynamics in our economy, right? We know, for example, that the inflationary period that we've just experienced was not the result of big public investment. It was the result of many, many other things. Um, maybe it's lack of public investment in, in you know, our supply chains. It was, it was the result of you know, big corporations taking advantage of a moment to jack up prices and, and push prices up and keep them high. So I think you know, in addition, as we look ahead to the next crisis, because there's always another crisis coming down the pipe, and we're trying to learn the lessons from this one, I think it's also important to recognize that public investment alone is incredibly important. It got us to a, you know, a remarkably robust economy and re resilient um, recovery today, and it's not enough, right? We also have to tackle many of those underlying power dynamics that sustain um, bad outcomes, right? So we have to go out after that outsized corporate power that allowed prices to spiral out of control. You know, we And this is, I think, to me, also the lessons coming out of the Great Recession, right? Like, we never uh, addressed the sort of structural problem of the fact that you know homeowners, especially black and brown homeowners, were being exploited by these subprime loans, really going after those exploitative businesses that were providing those loans. So I think it's important to pair these big public investments with really um, a critical analysis of those power dynamics in our economy and how those power dynamics are facilitating you know the wealthy getting even wealthier, rampant inequality. Um, and you know, all of us not doing as well. And so just one other thought to add to the, you know, how we're thinking about responding to the next crisis down the road. I guess to follow that up, I mean, where do you think then, I guess I'll ask you this, Rikine, because you're just talking about, where do you think we fell short in this? Is it that the programs were temporary? Is it that there wasn't other regulation? Like, how do you think about like, if there is a next time, what are kind of the lessons of like, what else to do? assuming that the lesson isn't, we did a lot, it caused inflation, therefore we should never do anything. Like, how do you think about that dynamic? Yeah, I mean, I think the lesson coming out of this, this particular recovery is we did a lot and it did a lot of good and we could have done more and it would have done even more good, right? I mean, we have a lot of unfinished business, right? We haven't yet really addressed um, some of the core drivers of what has been causing a cost of living crisis in this country for decades. We haven't addressed the cost of housing. We haven't addressed the cost of childcare, of healthcare, of education. And we've taken on bits and pieces of that. And you know, I really commend the administration and Congress for, for, in, you know, for shoring up the, the, the well-being of people who are really struggling in a period of immense pain. And also there's a lot more for us to do. So I think that is that's part of it. Um, and again, you know, paired with those big public investments is tackling the power dynamics in those industries, right? Like that, I mean, I, I know my panelists, my co-panelists can speak to this even better than I can, but, um, you know, childcare is broken in this country. Like we have to actually fix it. You know, 
uh, our housing system is broken. There's a lot of room for big public investment and, and crowding out um, private developers. Um, so I will turn it over to my panelists to kind of dig into that. But I think though that pairing to me is really what stands out. Uh, I think the only thing that I'll add to what Rakeem said and totally agree is in addition to the temporary programs, I think some of the effects of the investments, um, there's potential for that to be temporary too. Um, I think the the maybe number one thing that I worry about um, uh, in this recovery period is that we have this moment where the labor market um, is much stronger, um, certainly than it has been in a couple of years, but I would argue in some ways even stronger than it was prior to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And what that's meant is that workers are getting higher wages, um, they have more bargaining power on the job. We're seeing, you know, we saw like the hot labor summer, like a whole wave of strikes um, and, and impending strikes, including a potential UIW strike this week. Um, and all of those things are great. They help workers uh, build and sustain power. And because we're in this moment um, uh, where workers just happen to have more bargaining power because the labor market is tight, um, once unemployment starts to tick up, that progress will could potentially vanish. And so I think a, um, a challenge for us next time is one, for the programs that we know worked um, and that were temporary, um, like the child tax credit, like UI, we should just make those things permanent all the time. And we should also be thinking about what are the structural conditions that need to change in order to make sure that we can recover more quickly. I was really struck by one of Heather's charts where um, she was showing unemployment, the spikes in unemployment uh, um, in the immediate aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we did have a much stronger recovery, but we also had a much more volatile spike and unemployment. And that's a direct result of really um, bad labor part policies that put people um, at the whims of their employer and at the whims of the labor market. And so I think that's sort of one thing that we can do in this time where we have a little bit of free time here um, is try to focus on how do we um, avoid that situation from happening in the first place to start. I'll, I'll just <clears throat> quickly add actually to an earlier point Angela made about essentially a new group of actors, new sort of way of thinking. And, you know, if you go all the way back to uh, around when the financial crisis was beginning, um, you know, at the time, at least, there was a lot of talk. I think Larry Summers coined the term of time, timely, temporary, and targeted. And, you know, even he he actually shifted over, over time um, to, I think it was speedy, substantial, and sustained. The thing I was trying to push for where we've fallen quite short was subs this time around was substantial substantial, sustained, and structural. And that's sort of related to the permanence, but also not everything was about a fiscal response, right? There are regulatory changes and other things that are needed. So for example, you know, the, the tight labor markets got us to uh, historic lows in black unemployment, historic highs in prime age um, employment among black women and so on and so forth. But uh, that doesn't give us the long-term structural changes we need so that people aren't waiting as a community to be out of recession for one year every decade because we're running a very tight labor market, right? Um, so I think the structural is where we fell short um, in general. Yeah, if I can just build on that and, and some of the folks, things the other folks said. Um, three things. First of all, I think, you know, obviously it's very unfortunate that a lot of these programs are temporary, but, you know, along with permanent programs, we also need to really be working for permanent changes in the way we think about the economy and economic policy. Um, I think, you know, the, the line, Heather, Heather's line about how, you know, we now know that unemployment and recession is a policy choice is so important if we can keep saying that and, and get that into the consciousness that this is not like the weather. It's not just something that happens. It's something that is perfectly preventable and therefore something that we have a collective responsibility to prevent. You know, I think, you know, things like the pandemic unemployment insurance were, were such positive models for what social policy can look like. And it's important to, to make it, to get as much as we can into the conversation that this is not just a one-off pandemic response, but actually just a, a better way of doing things. Um, I think the strong labor market, you know, the issues that Angela mentioned, I think are, are gonna be critically important. I don't think there's any reason the labor market has to soften. I don't think there's any reason unemployment has to come up. I think you know we can be looking at a world where for the indefinite future, unemployment is much lower than we're used to. Workers have more bargaining power. You know, I was talking to a former student the other day who was telling me, you know, he was going back to look for um, retail jobs. He said, it's just a completely different environment than in the past. You know, it's such so much better if you have to work behind a cash register now. 
that's something we would like to preserve, but we have, we're going to need new institutions to manage that. You know, if we say, we're not going to say workers have too much power, so we're going to raise the unemployment rate. We need other ways of managing wages. And then I think the third more specific thing, you know, if you look at the inflation statistics, there's obviously a lot of measurement issues, but if you look at the statistics, we don't have any inflation today. What we have is a housing cost problem today. And I think, I think we're going to need to address that specific piece directly because certainly in the statistics the thing that is driving the rising cost of living is overwhelmingly housing costs and that takes a completely different response than the sort of macro inflation uh response that people have been talking about for the past couple of years one thing and this came up kind of in our, our prep call from you josh is like how do you manage like the economy right now that is pretty strong that is kind of booming like what like how do we keep Assuming we do want unemployment to stay this low and this job market to be this strong, like how do you manage an economy that that looks like this right now? And do you think we have the tools in place? I think we're it's going to be an experimentation. I think I think the first thing to me is just close that unemployment door. It's not acceptable to say workers have too much power, so unemployment needs to be higher. You need to find other tools. I think things like you know job training and kind of employment programs that honestly were very bad solutions to a problem of unemployment and stagnant wages are maybe better solutions to a problem of labor scarcity. I think that there's got to be ways to support and encourage and pressure employers to provide the kind of job training that they've um, kind of not had to do in a period of, of weak labor markets. I think that a lot of what's going to happen is opening the door to employment for people who haven't been considered, you know, acceptable employees, people with prison records. You know, that's that's got to be part of the answer here. I think it's going to take a lot of experimentation. I think. Um, you know, something people talk about like um, sectoral wage bargaining or, um, uh, you know, wage boards where you say, you know, we don't want to manage wage growth through unemployment, but we also have concerns about a situation where a few workers in sort of privileged situations are getting really rapid wage increases. And if you want to manage that in a collective way that has representation for labor at the table, you know, historically, um, for a lot of uh, the 20th century, strong unions were actually considered an anti-inflation tool because you can actually negotiate over wages and trade off wage gains against other things that workers want instead of just having employers kind of bid up wages against each other. So I think we're going to need new collective tools for wage setting so that we can manage, you know, a strong labor market without having to go back to the 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 the, the blunt instrument of, of, of hot rate, you know, trying to get the unemployment rate up, which I think, again, we should just say is, is not something that a civilized society should be doing. And we could add a little thing on yeah. care. Okay, just a little a little thing on caregiving. Uh, we had a pandemic. That was a different cause for this most recent recession, obviously, than the previous one, uh, which was uh, driven part by the financial um, markets. And um, that did lead to, lead to some focus on caregiving that I don't think we've ever seen. But here's an example where if we say, do we have some of the tools to sort of manage um, some of the challenges, right? I mean, more labor supply obviously has, has helped and can continue to help with uh, you know some of the the challenges, including on the inflation side. But um, we do have the tools. We are so far behind um, what our where our knowledge is on how to meet people's childcare needs, their elder and disability care needs, um, help people have access to paid family medical leave, and, and so on and so forth. Which you know, by the way, save lives when we did it on a temporary basis in the um, pandemic, but uh, you know, we entered unusually among wealthy countries with very limited infrastructure on the caregiving front, um, and especially with a complete lack of a national paid family medical leave program. But, you know, these are actually tools that we don't necessarily think about as first and foremost, helping us with macroeconomic stability and whatnot. But they are uh, very much tools that uh, could have helped us this time around in more, a far more robust way. And our knowledge uh, dramatically exceeds uh, the actual policies we have in place. I know like this is not a specific arena, but it's more of a political question. I'm not sure who would want to take it, but like, assuming, like, everybody here agrees, like, yes, we need caregiving, we need X, we need Y, we need Z. Like, how do you think about, like, creating any political impetus to, like, do this stuff, given that, like, we had an opportunity just now, we didn't. Like, whoa, well, how does that work ever? I don't know. What's that? I can kick us off, and I'm really curious to hear what others have to say here, too. I mean, 
I think it's important to name that the approach that the administration took to this recessionary period and recovery is a sea change. Like it is truly a flip of the script to what we've seen before. And that's important to name and acknowledge and and like bolster too, right? That the the different approach worked and we should celebrate those those wins. That being said, like I am I'm like actually kind of optimistic and also pessimistic at the same time. So I'm pessimistic because there's a bunch of big fights coming up that are tough, right? And that are really important. And it's really, really important that we win. But I'm optimistic because I think there's opportunities to double down on this really good approach, right? So we are potentially about to enter a world where folks shut down the government, right? Folks can shut down the government. Um, that's an opportunity for us to, to talk about exactly what we lose when we um, stop critical public investments um, temporarily or permanently. Like we know, we've seen this movie before, we know how it goes. In 2025, we're about to have a big fight on taxes with a lot of the individual provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the Trump tax cuts um, expiring. Um, so let, let's have that fight, right? Like let's take it on and talk about how tax policy can shape the way power is distributed in our economy and like who should benefit from good tax policy. Um, it shouldn't be the wealthy and mega corporations that have the deck stacked in their favor right now, right? Um, so I do think there are opportunities coming up. I don't think the political landscape to have these conversations and to frankly, to make real policy change is as bleak as people want us to believe. Um, I think it's actually important for us to grab every opportunity by the horns and you know, keep em emphasizing that drumbeat that this approach works, right? Understanding public investment that is people-centered, bolsters our economy and sets us up for a more resilient economy over the long haul, that works. Um, tackling these big sort of underlying structural issues that India was talking about at the beginning, that works for, for a healthier economy. And so we really should be um, you know, game and eager and ready to, to take on those big fights and have those conversations and not shy away from them. And I'll just add, I mean, I think similar to Rakeen, I find myself in this like optimism, pessimism frame consistently in part because on the one hand, you know, we've got low unemployment, inflation is coming down, black unemployment is going down, like there are all these things that look like, and we're spending money, you know, it's like all these things that are like, oh, good, good, good. And um, at Demos, we work on the economy and democracy. And on the other side of things, uh, we're facing real multiple crises of our democracy, right? Like we, um, you know, there's sort of the the insurrection as part of that, but there's also um, the sort of extreme corporate influence that influences um, all of the policymaking that uh, we get to do in this country. And I think Rakeen alluded to it earlier. And so, you know, when I worry about um, sort of what happens next, who doesn't want this, you know, there are folks who have vested interest in ensuring that we have really paltry, sparse public goods in this country, um, and those haven't gone away. Um, I think what's happened over the last couple of years is incredible in part because um, we've been able to secure some wins in spite of that, um, and it's still a pretty uphill battle, and so, you know, as I think about how we're able to, you um, uh, sort of continue proving that it's good to have public investment in our economy, it's good to invest in the most marginalized. Um, we also, you know, are are not just fighting um, sort of another ideological realm, we're, we're fighting really moneyed interests who have a vested interest in ensuring these changes don't happen. Yeah, if I can just, just reiterate something Rakeen said, you know, it, she said it's not as bleak as they want us to believe. And I think that last part is important. You know, the, the other side, wants us to believe that that things are hopeless. You know, there is no alternative is always the strongest argument for, for you know, the, the sort of right in all its forms. And I think that one of the most important lessons of the past couple of years is that the space of possibilities is much wider than, than we've been led to believe. So I don't want to sound like the pessimist here, but I had this on my list of questions. I might as well bring it in. Um, like, Okay, let's say like I we all buy into like the the recovery has been really good. The economy is really strong. Blah blah blah. You look at poll after poll, and people tell you actually everything sucks. I talk to people in my life, and they're like actually everything's terrible, and I you have no idea what's going on. So I don't know who wants to take this, but like, what do you make of that disconnect? Like, I nobody has like a right answer about what's going on, right? But like, what do you all think is going on? I don't know if anybody specifically has like a good answer, but I'm curious what you think. Indy, do you have thoughts? Uh, I always have thoughts. I think um, on the one hand, um, 
you know, we had a pretty incredible set of crises that in particular this presidential administration inherited. Um, and I think uh, it's tough for people to imagine counterfactuals and they sometimes don't have the longest memory. Um, but, you know, Angela sort of talked about the importance of these, right? I mean, you have to uh, imagine what the alternative was. And I do think that one challenge, even though I think we, Heather and her, uh, the team there made the right set of choices in prioritizing driving down unemployment, one challenge is unemployment is often heavily concentrated on a smaller number of people who are all, all so already marginalized. Um, and inflation is often spread out um, much more so. And people aren't walking around here saying, well, you know, inflation for me is less than in the UK and EU, but 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 it is. Um, and uh, it tells us something about maybe our economic management, but uh, but that's not how people live their lives often, right? And so there is, I think, a psychological challenge um, that um, we have in people saying, well, look, my real disposable income is higher. Obviously not a con concept that regular people think about, but the point is they have more you know, mon money to spend even adjusted for inflation in many ways. And there's not a new challenge, right? Emily, as you know, in hist historically, it's always been a challenge, right? There are times where we actually had quite high inflation, but wages and incomes were rising even faster and people still complained. And like they would almost like, choose the lower living standard because of the sort of psychological challenge. So, I mean, that's, that's sort of part of it. I mean, I think we also have to Remember that um, you know some of the the boosts for a while were done through taxes and transfers, and I think we need that. That's essential, in my view, to addressing inequality and poverty. But we really need to also boost the take home wages and salaries of folks, which I think often gives them a greater sense of satisfaction, economic satisfaction, financial comfort for good reason. Um, and I think that's an area um, where there's a lot to do, including on. Um, uh, promoting uh, unions. And we're seeing, obviously, a lot of concerted um, actions by workers and whatnot. But, um, you know, for that to kind of spread across the economy, maybe more sectoral bargaining, other things that I think would help us sort of both manage the the boom, as Josh has sort of talked about, and uh, help people really feel the direct uh, benefits from it. And I would just say one related thing, you know, I also think often these things, you need something very salient. So, you know, the Inflation Reduction ha Act has these caps on things like insulin. They're negotiating now on, you know, 10 drugs for prescription drugs. And, you know, let, let's see how this stuff is covered and plays out. But, you know, I know for my own family alone, it saves like hundreds of dollars a month for my mother's a diabetic. And once these more salient things hit, like in a way the child tax credit did before, but it's no longer there. And often people don't know in our system who to blame. Um, so I think uh, let's see how some of that plays out. I completely agree with Indy on the sort of how do you feel unemployment versus how do you feel inflation? I think that's a huge part of it. I also think this is where the um, the like, not to sound crass, but like the sales pitch of it all comes into play. Um, you know, we've had these really unprecedented investments. I agree with Indy. We shouldn't expect people to remember what happened a decade ago or what happened in the UK just a few years ago. That's ridiculous. But um, one thing that I think is important, an important piece of the story is being able to tell the story of how this uh, recovery was different um, and how this points to sort of a different way of running the economy in the future. Um, and it doesn't mean that you know, just saying that will automatically, you know, continue to lower prices for people or that they'll say, oh, actually, I do feel really good about the economy. But, you know, if we look at just the numbers, um, we typically say, oh, actually, people are better off because their wages are increasing, they're outpacing inflation, they have jobs. Um, so if they're not feeling it, um, I don't want to discount that they, you know, aren't struggling. And some of those struggles predate um, the pand the pandemic, right? Like people still had inadequate housing, not enough food, um, not enough um, access to affordable health care. Um, you know, all of those things can continue to persist um, uh, and, and are things that that um, have to improve in the future and, and policymakers have to address in the future. But I think in the short term, there's something to be said about helping people sort of see um, the situation as it is, see the amount of investment that's coming to their communities, see the ways um, that uh, these investments will help them specifically. That's all a part of this um, to help sort of bridge that divide between um, what we see in the numbers and how people are feeling in real life. 
Yeah, if I can just add a couple things to that. You know, there's this uh, survey of small businesses that I, I look at every so often, and it's it's really interesting. Um, you know, if you ask these small business owners about the state of the economy, um, you know, as you might guess, they're, they're generally the responses are very negative. But then when you ask them, you know, are you planning to expand your business? Are you planning to make major investments? Are you planning to increase hiring? The answers are all very positive. So, so at least in this group, you know, the assessment of the economy in the abstract and of their actual circumstances facing them are very different. And I think that's true in some polls of, you know, just general people I've seen as well. Um, I think there's a couple of specific factors that maybe play into that. One is, um, you know, with inflation, we pay a lot of attention to the rate of price change. But for most people, even for us in our daily lives, you think, you know, this is how much a sandwich should cost. This is how much, you know, daycare should cost for my kid. And you've got a benchmark of prices from a few years ago. So inflation can be back down to 2%, but prices are still higher than you kind of feel they ought to be. And I think in inflation specifically, that probably um, shapes people's perceptions. I think with wages also, you know, as we've seen, you know, for the past, you know, for this year, for the past six months or so, wages have been rising faster than prices. So real wages have been going up. Um, but people don't necessarily see that. And part of the reason is a lot of the wage gains go to people uh, who switch jobs. If you switch, if you leave your job and take a higher paying job, you don't perceive that as the state of the economy. You perceive that as you getting lucky or making a smart choice or being rewarded for your hard work. You know, it's something happened to you individually. So the gains are not perceived as the economy, the, the costs in terms of higher prices are. Um, and then I think, you know, another factor here that we shouldn't discount is that the big, you know, the, the big wage compression over the past couple of years, you know, Aaron Dubé, um, the labor economist says about a quarter of the increase in wage inequality of the past 40 years has, has gone away in the past three years. So I think from the point of view of us on this panel, that's a very positive development. But if you look at who actually dominates sort of public discussion of the economy, it's not necessarily the winners from, from that process. And I think, you know, I think that, you know, people, the people, let's say, who hire, you know, domestic servants and people to do yard work play a much larger role in public discussions than the people who are actually doing those jobs. Um, so I think I think that may color some of the public discussion um, as well. And then the last thing I was at, I would add is that, you know, regardless of people, what people say when you ask them these big abstract questions, specific public spending programs tend to be very popular. You know, I know when they introduced universal uh, pre-K here in New York City, you know, the approval rate among parents, you know, for this program was like 98%. Everybody loved it. I'm sure if you ask those same people about city government in a more abstract way or public spending in a more abstract way, you would get a very different answer. I just wanted to jump in briefly and, and want to, to double click on something that Josh just brought up, which is this question of, to be really technical about it, levels versus rates, right? Which is people, when they're sitting around thinking about their household finances, aren't thinking, hmm, like month over month CPI has come down. So I am now better off because price growth is slower, right? What they're thinking is like, shit, groceries are still really freaking expensive. And if my landlord raises the rent next month, then I am screwed and I won't be able to actually live the life I'm living or provide for my kids or or do it, make the choices to leave a job that's really um, not serving me because of, you know, whatever reason. So I think it's just important to kind of, to, to like put it in the context of, of real people's lives. And um, yeah, apologies for cursing. Uh, Indy's calling me out in the chat. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, I think that is actually how people think about their, their the economy, right? People are thinking about it not as a series of statistics, but as a series of choices that they're making about their daily lives and how they can provide and how they can live and whether or not they feel good generally or they feel bad. And I think we should take those feelings really seriously. I don't, I mean, I, as much as I, I am um, really impressed by by the, the progress that we've made, I also think it's incumbent on us to hold ourselves and policymakers to a higher standard, right? Which is that people have been struggling for a really long time. These, these problems that we're talking about are not, um, you know, contained within the pandemic period or this inflationary period. These are, this is a, the, the manifestation of a cost of living crisis that's been really decades in the making, decades in the making, right? And, um, you know, as Heather said before, and as, as others have reiterated, all of those are the result, that, that cost of living crisis is the result of a series of policy choices we've made. And we can make better ones and we can hold ourselves to a higher standard, right? The pre-pandemic economy is not what we should be aiming for. We can tackle um, these underlying, you know, 
core things that allow people to live a good life, you know, access to childcare, access to healthcare, you know, certainty that they won't be, um, you know, living in a precarious housing situation. Um, so I just think it's important for us as we're having this conversation about the vibe session, um, you know, to really, you know, the vibes do matter and they, they matter because they are the result of very distinct and deliberate policy choices that we've been making for a really, really long time. And, um, you know, we can do better and that's okay to say, and that's okay to, to strive for. And in fact, I think it's actually really important for us to be striving for. So I am going to hop to some of the audience questions. I think one gets a little bit at what we were just talking about, uh, the housing affordability crisis. Uh, so somebody wrote in, you know, obviously there are long waiting lists for public housing. People have been on public housing waiting lists for decades. We know that there is a supply problem. Um, you know, how should this person ask, should we be developing and investing in social housing? Not sure if anybody has thought yeah, I mean the answer is obviously yes, but I think I think and this this is obviously a somewhat fraught topic at least in some quarters. But I think it's got to be a, a three pronged piece. I think I think we need uh, to do something about land use um, rules that really restrict the supply of housing. I think I think we do need more private housing that's not getting built because of the the restrictions that that prevent you know uh, affordable housing from being built, even you know if developers want to do it in, in most of the country. Um, I think we need uh, more, we definitely need more investment in social housing, um, different forms, you know, whether that's public housing or various types of nonprofit entities, we need a lot more investment there. And then we need more uh, protections for, for renters, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's been a, since 2007, there's been a significant shift, especially among younger households back towards renting. And I think there's actually some positives about that, but you need to actually give people who rent the kind of security uh, that, that homeowners have, if you want that to be viable for people. And then, you know, in settings, you know, the, the, the actual solution is to build more affordable housing, but in the short run where you simply have a, a housing scarcity, you do need to limit the ability of, I think, of landlords to take advantage of that. And I think there's definitely a place for, for rent regulation in the mix here. So I think, I think it would be a mistake to sort of zero in on one of those pieces and say, this is the answer. I think, you know, it's obviously very hard in the United States because so much housing policy is done at a state and local level, but I think we do need to be if we really want to address the housing affordability problem, we need to move forward on all, all three of those um, pieces. I will hop to a different one. Um, despite record low unemployment, the SNAP program has record high enrollment numbers and food banks have been consistently overwhelmed since 2020 with demand only increasing with the end of SNAP emergency allotments. Uh, this person asks, how do we bring these numbers down given the current political reality. What's your baby has thoughts? Well, a good chunk of SNAP participation is people struggling in the low paid, low wage labor market. Right. So it's, you know, the the lack of consistent predictable hours, uh, the fact that unemployment tends to be lower, obviously, for a lot of those jobs. And the fact that wages, though ha they have been rising, are, are quite low in some parts of the country. I mean, we haven't raised the federal minimum wage since 2009, and the bill that did that was 2007. It's the longest stretch in United States history since the establishment of the minimum wage without it rising. Obviously, some localities and states have taken some action on their own, but that's not going to help folks in Alabama or Mississippi or Arkansas. Um, we're going to have to have, uh, you know, some federal increases there. Um, but, you know, SNAP, SNAP participation is overwhelmingly a symptom of, of these struggles that folks face. Some chunk of folks who participate in SNAP, SNAP are in families with people where people have disabilities and are elderly. And we, we still have a somewhat aging population. We may have a decade or so more to go before we kind of peak on that front. So you might expect some uh, participation increases, all the things being considered there. But no, um, we are uh, running, though maybe cooling, but a still relatively hot uh, labor market in a good way. Um, and I would actually expect, um, you know, uh, some declines in participation there. Uh, there was obviously also some ag some agreement in the, uh, you know, a the agreement in a technical term, but in the legislation on the debt limit that both uh, expanded and shrunk. SNAP, and we'll have to see how states implement those. So that could cut either way. But the Congressional Budget Office estimated a slight increase actually in SNAP spending as a result. But 
uh, the expansions were for folks aging out of foster care, um, veterans, um, and I think um, uh, maybe some folks with disabilities. But we we don't you know we don't know how that's going to play out because they also made it stricter and added time limits for folks who are older adults and struggling in the labor market when. As you age, even from your forties and forties to fifties, fifties and sixties, I mean your your chance of disability goes up significantly. And I, I do want folks to know that the United States is among the strictest disability eligibility standards um, in the in among peer countries. So the standards for qualifying for our disability benefits programs are, are quite demanding. So a lot of folks have disabilities that are short of qualifying for those programs, and they do. Um, benefit from programs like SNAP, and you can obviously benefit from SNAP even if you get disability benefits. I'll stop there. I have another question in here. Um, kind of got it, but given all the lessons learned uh, in all of this spending, why is there so much support for austerity among conservatives and and centrists? Uh, you know what? Okay. About Sorry, I wouldn't correct something I said. It was it was people yeah. experiencing homelessness, not people disabilities. It just hit me for a snap that we expanded though. But sorry about that. Yeah. Did, did my so the, I'm sorry, I can just say that again. Uh so the person asked, you know, given all of these lessons learned, why is there support for austerity among conservatives and centrists still? Well, Angela, do you want to you said some of it earlier, but Oh, yeah. I mean, I think obviously money and politics has something to do with it. Um, and and um, corporations benefiting from us having less things that are public uh, or fewer things that are public. So I think that's that's one. Um, I also think that, um, you know, austerity is something that helps sort of um, do the work of stoking division, of creating this false sense of scarcity. Um, I think, uh, JW, I think you said it earlier, sort of the notion that um, uh, um, we can't have things, but, um, you know, I think that there is some, uh, political benefit to, um, having, uh, a policy around austerity. And I think it, there's a, certainly some benefit financially to corporations. And so, you know, those things haven't gone away in this moment. Um, I do think that, um, some of the work, uh, that's happening through the IRA and chips and bill and, and, um, uh, even still through ARPA, um, show that public investment can actually um, help people and spur private investment. And so it helps sort of turn that idea on its head that public investment will crowd out private investment. Um, but I think some of that is also um, just, you know, uh, old and bad economic ideas that are backed by people who have a vested interest in making sure that those ideas stick. Yeah, I agree with everything that Angela said. I also want to name that austerity dovetails really nicely with some deeply rooted narratives around who deserves in this country. Um, and those narratives it should be stated like are, are deeply racialized, right? And so, um, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's big, big corporations who are benefiting, but it's also austerity forward, forward approaches are really tapping into, you know, a, a deep cultural thread that we need to undo um, that says like certain people are more deserving than others and you should work hard. And if you work hard in this country, you get ahead. And just again, like completely just like bring us back to where I started, um, completely sort of ignores power dynamics and structural factors that really determine outcomes um, for people's well-being in this country. On that note, I believe we are out of time, uh, but thank you all so much for doing this. Um, and I guess it's back to Kitty now. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, it was such an honor to be part of this timely and enlightening event, Roaring Out of Recession. I do want to close by sending our heartfelt gratitude to our speakers today, Heather Boucher, Emily Stewart, Indy Dutta Angela Hanks, Rakeen Mabud, and Josh Mason. Your work is critical to ensuring our economy delivers what all people need to thrive. So thank you so much. Um, we'll be following up with a recording of today's virtual event, but if you'd like to follow up with one of the speakers, please email events at groundworkcollaborative.org. Thanks to all of you for tuning in today and have a wonderful afternoon.